take your Bibles, if you would, this morning, open them, and wait on me. We've been going through a series of messages that have been about the gospel in the Old Testament, and we're making a short transition where what I'm going to do today is present the gospel. And I'm going to do it in such a manner that the best thing I would recommend for you to do is to listen. If you would like to jot down a couple of the references along the way, by all means, feel free to do that. Uh, if you would like, you can listen on YouTube a little bit later, but mainly listen. The message that I'm going to say today, that I'm going to speak of, is highly offensive worldwide. We live in a unique time and situation in the United States of America that is changing. I don't know if you have noticed it, but some of our political leaders have even started talking about the extreme Christian right and have begun to even push back on the idea of the validity of Christianity. And then, and I've just got to say this, I am sick of seeing people misrepresent the rainbow. I'm tired of it. Because it is not a presentation of the LGBTQ plus 2I. I think that's what it is now, seriously. I mean, they keep adding things to it. Um, and the time, and, and here's the other thing, in the United States at this point, people do not actively persecute Christians. However, they will come back at us when it comes to salvation and how to be saved. The title of the message is, is what the gospel is and why it is essential. The gospel is the person and work of Christ. The goal of the gospel is to glorify God. God is glorified by salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, whereby He saves sinners. Now, for those who... This is not going to be a, a, a problematic statement for those who are sitting here. But for those who may listen at some point in the future, uh, it will be. Because what we believe about the Bible, the book that we hold in our hands, drives everything we think, we believe, and how we live. I have an ongoing discussion with a friend of mine who's been a pastor. Uh, we went to seminary together. And uh, he has said that sometimes he thinks that what he ought to do is just stand up and read the scripture. He says, because anything I add to it is less than what I read. And he and I have agreed that, and, you, and I've said this here, that if you want to hear God, I mean that literally, if you want to hear God, then you read the Bible. Because the Bible are not just the words of God. It is the word of God and it is the voice of God. So today, what we're going to do, turn to Romans 3. I'm only going to ask you to turn to a, a few passages, uh, but Romans 3 is one of them. Now, what I'm going to do from this point <clears throat> is get intricate about the gospel. Okay, I'm going to talk biblically and scripturally about what the gospel is from beginning to end. It's going to be a little technical at times. It's going to be a lot of scripture. <clears throat> but then at the very end, I'm going to get very simple because I'm going to put the gospel in four points. Now, the gospel is required because since Adam and Eve... Mankind has been born spiritually dead. 
In Ephesians chapter 2, 1, it is written, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And we read this in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. All. How many is that? Everybody, does that include us? At some point, yes. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Now that includes a baby at the moment of birth. That's an important point to make because we do not come into this world a blank slate, a sinless slate. We are born sinners. Verse 11, no one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside and together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is on their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and ministry and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. All you've got to do is look around you in this world. And you see that. Yeah, I see you. There's a wasp. Did I ever tell you about the time a lady was walking? I'm sorry. There was one time at a, another church that's not in this general area that a lady was coming out after Sunday school and buddy, she had a bead on me and there was something she was coming to tell me about and she was going to make sure I heard her. And she, I can remember saying, Brother Ron, I need to talk to you. And when she drew in that next breath, a wasp flew into her mouth. And I will never forget her going. <laughs> and then she said, never mind. <laughs> Back to the point at hand. Because we are all born in the condition that we just read, which is spiritually dead, we all need, every human being needs God to intervene on their behalf. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 3 to Nicodemus, he said, and this is a religious guy, he knew the Bible. Jesus told him, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Jesus, we know, did not mean physical birth, but spiritual birth. Being dead, we can't be born again by our own power. Just like babies don't choose when to come to this world. It takes a mom and a dad. It happens outside them. And listen to me, the spiritual birth is the same as physical birth. It is out of our control. It is something that God does on his own. Listen to Jesus from John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Still talking to Nicodemus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's a reference to physical birth, and the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, verse 8 is enigmatic, and I don't have time to go into it. I may, I may make just one comment. And then Jesus says in verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You, can I tell you just a little quick thought on that? There is no way we can predict who will get saved, when they will get saved, and where they will get saved. It is something that is like the wind. We cannot tell which way the wind is coming from, where it's going, we can't see it. We can see the effects of it. And that is what he is saying about what happens with salvation. When someone is saved, we, don't, we didn't see it coming. It happened. It was a God thing. But we certainly see the result of salvation. Okay? Now, thus, there is a mystery of salvation. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to have you all turn to more scripture than you're expecting. Philippians chapter 2, there is a mystery of salvation. We just saw that in John. The idea of being born again. 
And it is that God does the miracle of new birth. Now listen closely. I'm going to use a phrase. If you want to know more about it, ask me later. Because of our total depravity, that's the phrase, Jesus came to this earth with a purpose. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, here's what Jesus said. He said, I came to seek and save the lost the spiritually dead. In other words, it takes Jesus going to a person, finding them, and saving them himself. It is not something that we do. It's something Jesus does. Now, how did this transpire? Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God about how this happened. Though Jesus was in the form of God, which means that he existed before time began, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternal both ways before creation. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, he decided that he would not stay in the complete revelation of the Trinity in heaven. He made a decision. Verse 7 is that decision that he made with the Father and Holy Spirit. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. That does not mean that he didn't divest himself of his godhood, but rather what he did is he, uh, I guess I'm going to say hid it for a while, because he was still fully God and he was fully man at the same time. Verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, of, death on the cross. Now, why did Christ go to the cross? It was to seek and save those who were lost. He had to do something, and he knew what it was, in order to provide salvation for those who were spiritually dead, who could do nothing themselves, who were incapable of changing themselves from spiritual life, to, from spiritual death to spiritual life. They could not. I'm going to see if I can say this the right way. It won't be. They couldn't born themselves. They couldn't birth themselves. They couldn't do it. So Jesus had to come and do that. Listen to Romans 6.23. Listen to this one. Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. That's the sin condition. Remember, we do what we do because of what we are. We don't become what we are because of what we do. Because we are born a sinner, we commit sin. So Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You're in Philippians, right? Turn back one book. Go to the left one book. I've, I've taken you to this passage. I know it was before, but guys... What we're about to read, for me, is the absolute most amazing passage almost in all of the Scripture, but especially as it is personal to every one of us. We are about to read the most significant miracle that every believer has ever experienced. Did you know that? That believers, every believer, has experienced a, a genuine miracle from God. Here it is. Ephesians 1.18, Paul is writing to the Ephesians and he, he, he is saying that he prays that they will have the eyes of their hearts enlightened. In other words, he's wanting them to understand something significant. That you may know what is the hope to which he, God, has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? In other words, he's saying, I want you to know who you are. I want you to know what you are and what you have coming down the road. Verse 19. Let's slow down here. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? That's the introduction of the miracle. According to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of the heavenly places. When God saves us, it is just as much a miracle 
as when God rose Jesus from the dead. It is our resurrection. We are given new life. It took the same power from God to accomplish our salvation that it did for Jesus to come back from the dead. Are y'all getting that? I mean, meditate on that a little while because the miracle of sal salvation is being born again. Turn to Matthew 11. Turn to Matthew 11. Ephesians 1 that we just read is the what. And now I want us to examine the how of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our salvation. Now I'm going to dig a hole and then I'm going to get us out of it. No, actually God's going to dig a hole and he's going to get us out of it. Okay? All right. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Jesus is the one speaking and I want you to look at what he says here. All that, you know the definition of that word. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Now let's slow down. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Do you see that? Do you see? Do you know why you're saved? If you're saved, you're here this morning and you're saved, it is because Jesus Christ Almighty Himself chose to reveal Himself and God to you. That's the reason you believe. That's the reason we repent. That's the reason we have faith is because Jesus did what we could not do as a result of our spiritual death. That's how we get saved. Now, at that point, if you're not careful, you're going to become a Calvinist in a heartbeat. You really are. If there wasn't for verse 28 and 29, you would. Look at, 20, look at 28. Jesus then, right behind that says what? Come unto me, how many? All. How many is all? That's called a universal call. That's why we talk to everybody about Jesus. That's why we share the gospel with them. That's why we encourage them to be saved. You know why? We don't know if the Holy Spirit wind is going to blow by them or not. We simply don't know. That is why we do what we do. Let's keep reading. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now let me tell you something. That's what every person is looking for. That's what every Democrat and Republican in Washington, D.C. is looking for, is right here, inner peace. And they think they can find it through power. They think they can find it through legislation. They think they can find it through a flag that has a bunch of different colors. And I'm telling you, from what Jesus said here, He is the only way to find rest for the soul. Every person needs Jesus. They don't need God. God is generic now in our, in our world. What they need is Jesus. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, you know John 3.16, but I'm going to go a little bit further down the road on it. Just listen here. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And by the way, the world, the word world there doesn't mean everybody. It means all kinds of. Okay? To mean everybody, there'd be universalism, and we know that everybody's not saved, right? So the word world has got to mean something else, and it means all kinds of people. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There we have a presentation that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. 
There is no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. And people take offense at that. And they will argue against you. They will fuss against you. They will cancel you. If you don't know what that means, talk to those three over there and they'll tell you. Y'all know, don't you? Anyway, just nod your head yes. Do that. Do this for me. Okay, thank you. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Listen to John eleven twenty five. 25. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 17, 1. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. He's talking about the crucifixion and resurrection. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, now listen, listen close, to give eternal life to all you have given him. You know what that implies? That there are some he didn't. And Jesus gives life to all who are given to him. And those are the one who are called. Everybody's called. But the Spirit is like the wind and gets some people and doesn't others. And by the way, just because someone doesn't believe today doesn't mean they won't tomorrow or next week or next year or next decade. We never quit. We never give up. Listen to John 17, 1. Jesus lifted his eyes. We already read that part. It says, Father, that I was come, that Son may glorify you. Uh, and this is eternal life. Listen to John 17, 3. If you want to know what eternal life is all about, here's the words of Jesus. This is salvation. This is the gospel. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ in you have sinned. That's the only way salvation happens. Acts 4.12 There is salvation in no one else. There was no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That is a, that is a, a one and done statement. There's no room for anything outside that. 1 John 5, 11. God gave us eternal life and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God, Jesus, does not have life. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Now, when I missed my turn earlier, if you weren't here, I'll tell you about it on the way home. I was talking with Joseph. And I told him that there is an easy way to find out. You can ask one question and find out whether or not a person is a Christian. Here's the question. Look at him and say, would you tell me who Jesus Christ is? And depending on their answer, you will know whether or not they are saved. If a person cannot explain who Jesus is, in basic, easy, elementary terms, they're not saved. I've, I've used this illustration many times before. Um, Aaron, could you tell me how to... I've never been to your house, have I? No, I have not. <laughs> could you tell me how to get there? Yeah. 
Why? Because you've, you've been there. You live there. Listen to me. <clears throat> you can tell somebody how to get where you have been. If you cannot tell somebody how to come to know Christ, there's a very good chance that you do not know Him yourself in terms of salvation. You may know about Him, but that does not mean that you know Him. It doesn't mean that He knows you. That's an even better Bible term. And what I've done is I've taken a whole bunch of Scripture, and what I've done is I have laid out a huge foundation of what it means to be saved, what the Gospel is, what uh, the personal work of Christ is, but I also know that nobody else in here in this room has been to seminary but me. So I want to boil it down to four points. Everybody's a sinner. Point one. Everyone is born spiritually dead. Point two. Jesus came to live the life we should have lived and die the death we should have died. Point three. There is no other way of salvation but Jesus. Point five. I'm sorry. Repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Those five things is all it takes. You don't have to go into all the intricacies that I went to about the Trinity and eternity past and all that. All you got to do is just hit the basics. And I'm going to conclude with one verse of Scripture that I do want you to write down. I do want you to write down. I want you to memorize it in the next five minutes and you will be able to. It's Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. <clears throat> you probably know it and you just don't know that you know it, but I'm going to show you now that you know it so that you know you know it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's it. In other words, the answer to that is, is we don't. Here's what I want to ask us to do, leaving here today, is let's settle in on the gospel, the beauty of it, the preciousness of it, the personal element of it, the love of it, and then realize that there are people around us that God has put into our lives to share the gospel with them. Not to go as in detail as a preacher with degrees would do, but just to share with them what God through Jesus Christ has done in your life. And don't be afraid to tell them in gracious, kind, and loving way that apart from Christ, there is no salvation. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, the gospel is so beautiful that angels long to look into it. It can become intricate, but yet it is so simple that even a child can understand it. Father, I pray that you will affirm in the heart of each believer today the beauty and the wonder of the gospel through your scriptures, and that we will be that much more enlightened and, and excited about serving you in sharing this gospel and making disciples of all nations.